Now, we're still in Luke chapter 10. Going back to verse 2, picking back up where we left off. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great. Remember what I said? The point of this is that Jesus didn't emphasize the readiness of the worker. He emphasized the readiness and the need of the field of the harvest, which is the opposite of what the church does. Now, it says, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, now watch this, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Now that word send forth, if you are familiar with any Greek at all, you would think that that word send forth, <clears throat> generally would be send forth on a mission, would be the Greek word apostello, where we get our word apostle. But it's not. The word used for send forth there is a Greek word ekbalo, and means literally to throw out with force. Right? It's the exact same word used when Jesus said, cast out devils. Same word. So he is saying that we should be praying the Lord of the harvest that he would cast out laborers with force, with the same force that we cast out devils. Now, this shows a couple of things. First off, laborers don't just leave. You know, they don't just go to the field. They have to be cast out. Okay? Why? Well, because several years ago there was a song that said, my house is full, but my fields are empty. It's kind of the way it is. We want to gather up, but we don't want to go out. <clears throat> and one of the things that I always tell people is that when you use words like send forth and cast and things like that, it is easier generally to cast out a devil than it is to cast out a Christian. <clears throat> okay? <laughs> Mainly because devils know they have to obey. Christians think they can pick and choose. <clears throat> so, we have to realize, and, and there's even during the conversations during the, the breaks, it is amazing because of how the church has, <clears throat> there is so much wrong that has just been over and over again just, just put into the church to where now we think that's normal and we don't even think to analyze it because it's such a, a part of the overall fabric of the church. Now, again, my job this week is to try to get you to change that. And to change that mentality. Now, I'm finding that the fastest way to get you to understand that, and one of the things I've said over the years is that the people that we're looking for, because we are an organization, we are growing, we, we ordain, we license, we plant churches, I mean, we're growing. And... To be honest with you, that wasn't my original plan. I just found something that was true and worked and was trying to share it. And then as people get a hold of the message, which is just simply the Bible, I mean, it's not like a separate message, but unfortunately it's not the message you generally get at church. But as you get a hold of what Jesus taught and what he did and how he did it, many times you'll learn it, you'll see it as effective, but when you go back to your home church sometimes they don't receive it. And if you stay there, and, and I've had people say, well, I'm going to be a missionary to my church. Okay, you know, we're going to change our church. Well, that's technically, that'd be fine if it worked. But usually it doesn't. And many times, if you try to stay there, if they, have not, if they don't receive the message, then it'll end up causing division. It'll end up causing contention. Okay, I'm not against division. Right? Jesus himself said, I, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. All right? He said, a house will be divided against itself. There will be you know, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and father against son and all this. So he's gonna, he said, if you're going to walk with me, you're going to have some division. So this idea that all division is of the devil, that's not true. Confusion is of the devil. But all division is not. Okay? Now, people say, yeah, but we've got to have unity for miracles to happen. That's not true. Right? First off, there was never any unity in Jesus' team. Right? Never. They were always fighting, arguing, arguing over who was the greatest. Um, at one point, James and John went and got their mother and brought her in and tried to get her to talk to Jesus to give them positions on either side. Come on. You know, and you read about the different people in there. and It said, even later on, Paul said he withstood Peter to his face because he was to be blamed. Uh, Paul had such... Uh, 
division between him and Barnabas over John Mark that it actually split the, the apostolic team. And yet right after that it says God worked mighty miracles, special miracles by the hands of Paul. So come on. You know, there, that division, that disunity didn't seem to affect the power of God at all. Okay? Usually the term unity, especially today, is used by people in leadership to try to keep people from rebelling or causing an uproar and trying to keep everybody walking in the same direction. It keeps trouble down. All right? It's usually a form of manipulation rather than an idea of really trying to get back to the truth of what the Bible says to do. Now, so when he said this, we're always trying to look at the person and perfect them as opposed to realizing the need and we don't realize most of the time that, well, you know, a lot of people probably don't like me quoting Bruce Lee, but he said the best way to learn to fight is by fighting. Right? You can train all you want, but at some point you got to get out there and fight. You got to get out there and do something. And the way you train is the way you will fight. Matter of fact, if you've, I've actually done a lot of research on the history of the church and when I was in martial arts on history of martial arts. And their development between the church and martial arts are identical. Alright? What I mean by that is, is this. <clears throat> the way that martial arts develop. And you say, why do you keep talking about martial arts? Because I have to stop you from thinking in religious terms. Alright? Jesus did not create religious people. The religious people killed him. Alright? Is that simple enough? Jesus talked about a kingdom. Alright? Not religion. Now he talked about worship, which we should do. But he did not give us a formula. He did not give us an order of service. He didn't give us anything like that. He talked about a kingdom. Matter of fact, if you read back in Isaiah chapter 9, I think it's verse 2. It said, when it talked about Jesus as Messiah coming, it says, And the government shall be on his shoulders. Right? It didn't say the church. It said the government. And so Jesus was bringing a new form of government. A new form. It was a kingdom. Right? When he said church, he was talking about a group of called out people. Right? Not a building. Not a steeple. Not all this other stuff. And to be very honest with you, Jesus died. Well, he died for the world, but he died for the church too. But he didn't die for buildings. Alright? He died for people. And the people are the church, right? The church is not a building. You cannot go to church. You understand? You, you, you go to a symbol. But you cannot go to church, right? Because no building is a church. You understand? Church means a group of called out people. Okay? It wasn't, the word ecclesia wasn't first used by Christians. There, it was already a term in use that was used by the Greek to mean a group of people that were called out that believed something and was almost like a council that it was an assembly of people that were coming out of something and into something else. All right Now, the reason I bring all that up is because I, if, as long as you think in terms of church, then you're going to think this. You're going to think that healing is a reward instead of a sign. Right? Healing is not a reward. Alright? Healing is a sign. Matter of fact, two times, or many times actually, but specifically two times in particular, we see the word where healing, or we see in the Word of God, where it mentions healing and it mentions signs. One of them is in Mark 16, and it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. And it goes to the whole list. And then it says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Well, that's healing. But now notice, that's not miracles. Okay? It doesn't say they'll lay hands on the sick and the sick are going to jump out of wheelchairs and run around. It doesn't say that. It says they'll recover. Right? The very word healing with an I-N-G on the end means a process. Alright? If you are running, it means you're in the process of run. Healing can be a short process or sometimes extended process. Now, we don't like the extended process. I don't agree that, it, that there should be an extended process. I believe that if we're going to be like Jesus, 
the healing should be rather rapidly. But all of Jesus' healings were not instant. Right? Many times, uh, the ten lepers, it says they were healed as they went. So they were walking. They, matter of fact, in front of them, they didn't see anything at that point. As they went, they were healed. Um, <clears throat> with the Roman centurion, it said, and the servant began to amend from that hour. Okay, that's recovery. Now, our idea is instantaneous healing. Usually, that is one of the gifts of healing that's in operation, or gifts of healings. In 1 Corinthians, it says gifts, plural, of healings, plural. Not one gift, many gifts of many healings. Okay? Now, the King James leaves the S off of the last one, but in the original Greek, it is both are in the plural tense. Now, in Mark 16, it says healing is a sign. Then, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says that tongues are for a sign. Not for believers, but unbelievers. Right? Now, if healing and tongues are signs for unbelievers, because it says that believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It doesn't say believers will lay hands on sick believers. It says believers will lay hands on the sick, meaning that the sick are supposed to be unbelievers. Okay? There's nothing there about believers. The believers are the well getting the sick healed, not just praying for other sick believers. Matter of fact, they're really, we'll see this more later, but the only reference to a believer being prayed for, for healing is in James chapter 5. Okay? It's the only reference. Everything else is all unbelievers. And even then, well, we'll see that, that that doesn't even say what people think it says. Okay? We read scripture religiously, which means you read it according to how you were taught what it says, not according to what is written. Okay? And you see scripture through eyes that have been tainted by religion. Okay? <clears throat> every time Jesus mentioned or cast out a devil, every time he mentioned it, he always mentioned two kingdoms at war. He always mentioned how can a kingdom remain if it's divided, showing that what he was doing was not dividing a kingdom, but was one kingdom at war against another kingdom. Uh, he says it over and over. The very word Satan means adversary. Okay, that means enemy. So it means warfare. All right? Devils. He said, he, he doesn't say, uh, you know, negotiate with devils till they come out. He said, cast devils out. That means warfare. It means imposing force upon an opponent until the opponent gives up. All right? It even tells us to resist the devil. Okay? The word resist is a military term. Even if you look in the Greek, it is a military term that Paul used. He said, give no ground to the devil. All right? Again, a military term. Paul was well acquainted with the Roman soldiers that were all around him. And all of Paul's terminology, all of the, um, even the terminology of Jesus, all goes back to warfare. You're going to see this says, it, this is not about religion. It is about two kingdoms at war. And the two kingdoms, the kingdom we serve, has technically already won. And you say, then why are we still fighting? Well, it's twofold. <clears throat> even in Iraq... We toppled Saddam Hussein, and yet the war was still going on. Why? Because just because the leader gets beat doesn't mean everybody under him gives up. All right? Satan was absolutely defeated, but it doesn't mean that there are not pockets of resistance that Christians are supposed to go out and stamp out. You understand what I mean by that? That, that being defeated doesn't mean giving up. Back in, when I was in high school, I remember there was a story of a... a some things that were going on on the island of Okinawa where a, uh, people were getting shot and different things were happening on the island. Things were disappearing. And so they <clears throat> created this manhunt to find out who was doing the shooting. And one of the things that surprised them was the caliber of bullet that was being used. <clears throat> Excuse me, because the, the caliber was a caliber that wasn't used since World War II. And so when they started searching the hills and the mountains and some of the jungles on Okinawa, they finally captured this guy, and he was a Japanese soldier from World War II that whenever Japan surrendered, he didn't get that memo. 
And so his last order was continue to fight and harass the enemy. And he was never, you know, contacted otherwise. So for 30 years, he lived off the land and continued to harass his enemy. Now, Japan had surrendered 30 years before. But that didn't mean that he gave up. Right? Being defeated, even surrendering, doesn't mean stopping fighting. Okay? It should, but it doesn't. And so, that's what's happened with Satan. Jesus absolutely defeated him. But now it's up to us to establish and to enforce God's kingdom, which means to dethrone Satan's works everywhere we see them. Now, his works are sin, sickness, poverty, uh, hate, all that kind of stuff. And so our job is to overcome evil with good. Amen? So it is, it is absolutely warfare. And once you understand it. Now, one of the things that are very good, and, and I don't know how many of you are military, ex-military, but I will say this. <clears throat> From all of our experiences, people with military backgrounds tend to understand this and get hold of it faster, and it works better through them because they have the military mindset. You take an order, you get a command, you do it. You obey it. You continue to obey it until you get a new command. All right? Well, the next command we're going to get basically is come up hither. Right? So until then, we keep doing Mark 16, we keep doing Matthew 28, we keep doing what Jesus said to do. Amen? And our job is to eliminate our enemy. Now, unfortunately, we can't kill demons. All right? So we cast them out. And the, even Abraham Lincoln said the same thing. The best way to not have enemies is to make them your friend. Well, we're not making demons our friends. Okay? But the way that we stop the enemy's work, the enemy can do nothing except through humans. All right? Sickness and disease, all that comes through humans. All the different things. Now, I understand it's demonic work, but it goes through humans. Uh, m murder, robbery, all these things are humans that are in alignment with the devil. Right? So our job is to convert them so that they no longer obey the devil and now they obey Jesus. And when we get them to do that, then we eradicate sickness, sin, all the different crimes, that kind of stuff it goes on. It's very simple. Uh, it is, you know, if you want to win an election, the way you do it is get more people to vote for your guy to com come over to your side and to vote for your guy instead of voting who they were going to vote for. Well, it's the same thing in Christianity. <clears throat> the way that, that we win a city is by getting people to vote for Jesus in their life, to vote him in as Lord. Now, he's already Lord, but it's up to us to accept that and to come under his authority. Amen? So my job is to get you away from this idea of thinking that <clears throat> somehow you're going to do something that is going to please God, and because he, you please Him, then He's going to reward you with power or something. Right? That's not the way it works. Okay? You have, if you are in Christ, because of Christ, you have favor with God. You understand? Not because of what you do. Because of what He did. Right? That's called grace. Now, because you have favor with God, you live right. Right? You don't live right to have favor with God. Right? You, you can't live good enough to have favor with God. You can't do it. But because you have favor with God, because you're in Christ, then you live right. Okay? And in doing so, you do what He has commanded. Now, the Scriptures are very clear. It says, if you say you love Him, but don't keep His commandment, then you're a liar. Right? I'm quoting Scripture. Now, it says, if you say you love God, but hate your brother then the truth is not in you, and you're a liar. So, he said, how can you say that you love God, whom you haven't seen, when you won't love your fellow man, whom you do see? Right? So, the way that you show your love for God is not here at the altar crying and saying, God, you know, pour out more. Or even saying, God, I want more of you. Okay? First off, you can't have more of Him. Right? It is impossible for you to have more of God. Okay? Now, what you have to do is, what you're really looking for is just the opposite. Is God having more of you. Alright? So it's not, the, the idea of coming together as a group and praying 
and begging God to pour out His Spirit on you to a point where you have more of Him is totally foreign to the New Testament. All right? <clears throat> Nothing, basically what we see in the church today is seen in the New Testament anyway, so that shouldn't be a big surprise to the most part. <clears throat> there were no healing services in the church for the first 400 years. All right? None. We, and no healing lines, none of that kind of stuff. Uh, mainly because, first off, uh, they didn't have church buildings until 313 A.D. when Constantine made Christianity the state religion in Rome. Until then, everybody met in houses. And just to give you an idea, to show you something, um, <clears throat> the reason Christians were persecuted by the Romans, not by the Jews, they, they, the Jews had a religious reason, but by the Romans, the persecution came because they considered Christianity a threat to national security. Right? That's why the persecution came. And because the Christians wouldn't bow to Caesar as being God. And they wouldn't do everything there. Rome saw Christians... The Christians back then didn't preach church. Right? Christians preach kingdom. Rome was a kingdom. And when Christians were preaching kingdom, then Rome thought Christians were a threat because they didn't understand that Christians were preaching a spiritual kingdom that should have physical results. All right? And so they thought it was a national security threat, which we can see the same thing today in many cases of situations here in the U.S. <clears throat> that, uh, like I said earlier, I, if, if it... <laughs> Might not be too long, and I have to have a passport to get up here. So, because of situations, you know, I told, I was talking to a guy the other day, and I said, "Well, you know, if you be, if you're seen talking with me, you're going to be known as uh, labeled as talking to an extremist." And I said, "Because that's what I've been labeled now. Because uh, I am extreme. I'm extremely healthy, extremely happy, extremely blessed. I am an extremist, right? I believe in right. I believe what is right. I don't believe it's negotiable, right? I believe what this book says is right." Simple as that. And at some point, it may come down to where uh, believing it and preaching it actually cost us. Right? And when we do, guess what? The church is going to thin out. Right? And the church, the, the body of Christ that remains will be strong. And the ones that leave were the flakes and the ones that were on for the blessings. Right? But, um, matter of fact, that's why you see the church so strong in China. It's because of persecution. Because you have to believe, and it may cost you. Amen? In America, it doesn't really cost you anything. Maybe reputation if you're really radical. Okay? But, we'll see. Anyway, now notice, <coughs> he says, Go your ways, verse 3, Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves, carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. Now watch, and into whatsoever house you enter... First say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. So there we're talking about a house, right? And really no mention of healing. But now watch. Verse 8. And into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick that are therein. Hear that? So where are you supposed to heal the sick? In the house or in the city? It says in the city, right? Now, I'm not saying you can't do it in the house, in the city. I'm just showing the differentiation. Because when he said you go into a house, that's what the early church was in. He was saying, there you go, that's where you go and, you know, if you want to say have church, that's where it was at. But now notice he said, but when you go into a city, now watch, whatever city you enter, they receive you, eat such things that are set before you, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them. So what are you going to do first? You heal first, and then you say. Right? Then you say, the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Now stop right there. Think about this. <clears throat> we have been taught that for you to get healed, you have to have faith. And for you to have faith, faith comes by hearing. Well, let me, let me say it the way that it's generally quoted. 
Faith comes by hearing and hearing. Faith comes by hearing the word and hearing the word and hearing the word and hearing it and hear, And when you hear it enough, you get faith. That is not what Romans ten seventeen says. It says faith comes by hearing, comma. Hearing, okay, comes by the word of God. Now, two things are there. There are you know, if you're in the medical field. And someone has a symptom. And you go into surgery and you cut them open. And then all of a sudden you find out, man, there's ten things in here that's wrong. Well, when you start trying to explain all the things that are wrong, you have to pick what do you attack first. You know? That's kind of the way this is. Because in this one verse that I just quoted, there's like ten things wrong in the church about it. Now, first off, It says, faith comes by hearing. Well, let's back up. This is in Romans chapter 10. Okay? And if you read there, it says, how can they believe except somebody go preach? And how can they go preach except they be sent? Right? Now, what that's talking about is salvation. It's saying, before a person can believe, they've got to be preached to. Before they can be preached to, somebody's got to go preach to them. Right? Right? It's not talking about, it's not trying to tell you how to have faith for a new car. You understand? It's talking about faith for salvation. It's saying, look, we have a job to do to go preach salvation. And even, he even tells us the whole thing. That the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Right? To all, the Jew first and Greek not. Now, but we take one verse, pull it out. And make it a doctrine. And you don't look at the context. Everything is context. You can take one verse out anywhere and make it say anything you want it to say. But you don't have the right to do that. Right? You have to take everything within context. In context, where it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, people say, all right, now, <clears throat> that's saying faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. You've got to hear the word of God and hear the word of God and hear the word of God. That's the first thing you hear. So, in other words, I can't have faith unless I keep hearing it. And i got to keep hearing it, and i got to keep doing it, and keep listening to it. And sooner or later, I'm going to keep getting faith until finally it just overflows, and I'm going to launch out. Okay, that is not what that verse is saying. It says, faith comes by hearing. Hearing, and then it tells you how hearing comes. Hearing comes by the Word of God. It doesn't say you have to have faith. You don't, it does not say you have to constantly be hearing it before you can have faith. It says that when you hear the word, faith comes immediately. Right then, faith comes. The first time you hear it, faith comes to believe it. Alright? Now, you have to understand it. If you don't understand it, the Bible says that the the enemy comes immediately to steal the word that was sown in their hearts. But the only people that the word was stolen from were the ones that did not understand it. Alright? So, if you understand it, the devil can't steal it from you. So the idea is that you have to hear the word preached. You have to understand what's being said. But when you understand it, faith immediately comes. Now whether you step into faith and believe it or not is up to you. That's a choice. But faith is there. So it's not a matter of how much word you get is how much faith you have. Right? Because to be honest with you, the most faith you ever have is when you got born again. And all you knew probably was John 3.16. Right? You didn't know theology. You didn't know all the scripture. You didn't know, but you just heard God wants to save you. Somebody read a scripture or told you something. Said God wants to save you, forgive you. Do you believe it? Yeah, I believe it. Jesus is the Lord. Okay. You didn't know anything else. Probably. Right? And with one scripture, without a full understanding of the Greek or anything else, you beat the devil. Isn't that right? Now, Faith, the greatest faith, is operating strictly on it is written without any evidence to back it up. That's the greatest faith you can have. Isn't that right? The more evidence you have, the less faith you have. Right? In other words, the more I have to prove it to you, the less faith you're operating in. But if I have to convince you through evidence and history... You know, we have a history together and I've, I've given you my word so many times and kept it that eventually you believe me. Okay, then that's not pure faith. Right? That's walking by sight. 
right? So the greatest faith you could have, and the greatest faith you ever had, was when you got born again. Right? You can never have that great a faith again. Why? Because now every experience you have with God gives you more evidence, which technically means less faith. You understand? You say, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. You're telling me I'm going to have less faith as I go on. No, I'm, listen carefully. You had faith to get in Christ. Your faith in Him puts you in Him. Your faith now in Him keeps you in Him. Right? But remember this, and this is, again, i got two directions I can go here. I'm trying to do them both at the same time. Let me finish the first one, and we'll come back. If I, if I forget this, and you remind me on the difference or what is, uh, is faith. Do you need great faith? Let me put it that way. All right? Now, that scripture, because I don't want to get off that scripture yet. It says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And mo many of you may have had some teaching concerning rhema and logos. And you say, so you have a see right there. It says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the rhema of God. A word spoken and quickened to you right then. All right, first off, probably everything you've heard about rhema and logos is wrong. All right? <laughs> you would think I'd get tired of saying that after a while, and really I do, but... I'll quit when everybody gets it. Okay? Now, first off, the problem in almost all traditions of man go back to this. They blame God for their failure. Almost every time. Well, oh, they didn't get... I prayed for you, and you didn't get healed? It must not be God's will. What am I doing? I'm pointing a finger at God. Isn't that right? Uh, well, I prayed for you, and you didn't get healed, so uh, God must be working out some character issues in your life. What am I doing? Point a finger at God. Okay? Now, I can go through all these things. Well, you know, God's trying to teach you something. You know? Uh, again, it's God, right? And it's funny because the only failure we have in the New Testament, it said that when they came down, when Jesus came down off the mountain, he saw his disciples there, and a man brought his son to him and said, Lord, I brought my son to your disciples, and they couldn't cast the devil out. And Jesus turned around and didn't tell the man. Didn't say... Well, God must be doing something in your life. He must be working something from you. He'll heal your son when, you're, when you get the sin out of your life. Jesus didn't say that. He didn't even say, well, what sin did the boy do that caused this thing? All right? He didn't even do that. And we'll get on generational curses later because that's a lie too. <clears throat> For now. Okay? It was good during the old days, but it's not true now. Matter of fact, and if you want to get ahead of me, you can look at, uh, not right now, but on your own time, you can look up Ezekiel 18, and it says, you will never say this again. Right? And he, he goes right into the very details of it. So, um, Larry Huck lives there in Dallas, moved down there, wrote the book. Then whenever he needed more money, he wrote blessings or curses that blocked the blessings. And so, you know, as long as people keep buying that garbage, I'm sure he'll keep writing it. So, he, um, well, we'll get into that later. Um, uh, you're going to find out I'm pretty blunt, right? Mainly because I'm tired of watching people get defeated and lied to and messed up. You know, I'm ready to see the church rise up and be like Jesus to the world. Amen? And so, you know, people say, aren't you afraid you're going to get sued? Psh, ain't got nothing for them to take. <laughs> ain't worried about it. Okay? <laughs> Real simple. <laughs> uh, only thing I own is my Tahoe. Take that and I'll fly everywhere I need to go. So what? You saved me time. Amen? So, I ain't worried about it. And by the time you get it away from me, it'll have, you know, 300,000 miles on it. So, I ain't worried about it either. I just retired my other one in January of this year, and it's got, what, uh, 423,000 miles on it when I retired. It's still running. Actually, my son's driving it now. And so, still running. And he's going to sell it to our nephew, who is a heathen. <laughs> and uh, I told him, I said, you know, as soon as you sell it to him, it's going to die. You know it. <laughs> He said, yeah, but I don't want to sell it to a good person. <laughs> so, so, but, but we're blessed. Our cars run forever. It's just amazing. Anyway, um, but that word rhema. Okay. Our traditions always point the finger back at God and say it's God's fault. So that's the first thing to look for. If you want to know if a tradition is, is of man or of God, find out who it points the finger at. 
when, when Jesus' disciples couldn't cast out the devil, he said, you faithless, perverse generation, how long do I have to put up with you? He didn't say it was God's. See, man's failure, or I should even say a disciple's failure to achieve Bible results does not dictate God's will. See, your failure to get the job done doesn't show anything about God's will. It just shows your failure. Right? And any failure to heal the sick is on the part of the person praying. Simple as that. Because we're the ones commanded to heal the sick. Right? You say, well, yeah, but God didn't do it. No, don't tell me. Because it's not you that does it. It's the Spirit in you, the Spirit of God, that actually does the healing. But you've got to do the believing. And if you're not believing, then the Spirit can't work through you. So it's not the Spirit's failure, it is your failure. Alright? Now, again, you go back to the garden. We see the same thing. It started with Adam and Eve. The first thing, when God calls to Adam and says, Adam, where are you? And he says, we, were, we hid because we were afraid. He said, because we were naked. And God said, who told you you were naked? And he said, well, this is what happened. And the first thing Adam starts saying, it says, alright, Lord, the woman you gave me did this. Look at that. That's what it says. The woman you gave me. What, what, what was the first thing he did? He pointed, God, if you hadn't given me this woman, everything would have been fine. He didn't even blame the woman. He blamed God for giving him the woman. You understand? So that's, that's the first way you can tell if a tradition is of man or of God. If it's of man, usually, then it will point the finger back at God and say the reason that is... God's failure. Now, uh, some traditions of man point the finger at man and end up saying, would, that's kind of a, more of a modern invention. Uh, basically saying, well, if you don't get healed, it's because you don't have faith. Right? Well, then what do they need you for? You know, if you're, it says lay hands on a sick and they'll recover. It doesn't say that if they have faith, they'll recover. Right? It puts the, the impetus on us to do the job. Amen? Now, again, we're going to go through several other stories and things in the Bible. I'll show you these different things to show you the validity of this. But I'm just hitting a lot of areas right at first to try to get some of these traditions out of your mind so you'll realize all this comes back very simply to understanding that healing is not a reward. It's a sign for unbelievers that believers are supposed to be giving to unbelievers. Now, as I said before, if... If there's only two times, two things that are mentioned as signs, one is, of course, there's several, but the two main ones are healing and tongues. And both are for unbelievers. Now, if these two signs are for unbelievers, how come we only do them in buildings where there's all believers? Right? You, I don't see any billboards in here. Right? Coca-Cola hadn't come in here and asked to put in a billboard. You know, and you know why? Because there's not enough traffic through here to warrant a sign. Right? So where do you put signs? Out on the highways where it, more people can see them. Isn't that right? Isn't that what Jesus just said right here? He didn't say when you go in the house, do it in the house. He didn't say that. He said when you go there, stay there. Why? He said don't go around from house to house. Why? Because one family will try to outdo the other family and they'll try to treat you better than the other family. It ends up being a competition. He said but when you go into a city, heal the sick therein. Now you can't possibly think that every sick person in that city is a believer. So we're talking about healing unbelievers. Right? Well now, so now think about this because what we preach in the church is I got to preach to you till you get faith. And when you get faith then you can get healed on your faith. Well when you get faith doesn't that make you a believer? I mean wouldn't that be to some degree maybe not in salvation necessarily but, but it doesn't say that. And Okay let me ask you this. Two th I'll give you Biblical examples, and I'll give you a uh, historical but more modern example. <clears throat> First off, who would we say had faith for Lazarus? Yeah, because it, it sure wasn't Lazarus, <laughs> right? I mean, come on, he was dead, right? Okay. Remember when Jesus went into Nain, the widow, the son was being carried out? Now, the amazing thing, and here's another point, just for to give you something to think about. We're going to talk about, again, this is all introductory, more or less. Okay? We're going to get into the details as we go along. Jesus never taught healing. Jesus taught the Word of God. 
He used healing to verify His words. Okay? Backwards church. We use His words to verify healing. Ain't that right? We try to convince people through the Bible healing is real. Jesus tried to convince people through healing that the Bible was real. Or that His words were real. Amen? You see, and then we wonder, why don't we see more results? Maybe it's because we're so backwards. You know? Really, we are seeing 100% results based on the backwardness of the church. Right? He had 100% healings. We have almost 100% non-healing in the church. Isn't that right? And when people do get healed, we're shocked. Isn't that right? Is this true? This is truth, all right? I, now, and, and let me back up. Hopefully by the time we're done here, you will know me well enough to know my heart. All right? I'm here because I love people. I love you. I love God. I, I want you to fulfill His will. All right? So anything I say, I'm not saying it. I never want to say it in a condemning way or anything like that. You understand? I'm here to help. I'm here to lift up and to help you, not to hurt you in any way. So don't take what I say as, as a jab at you. All right? But sometimes when you go to a doctor, <clears throat> they probe around a little bit. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, okay, how does that feel? How does, it, does that hurt? Does that, and, and they keep doing that until you say something hurts. Right? So that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for where it don't hurt. They're looking for where it does hurt. Okay? So in saying that, I hope you understand my heart. Because very simply, I'm not here to teach you another healing doctrine. Right? You've got enough of that. It's out there. Take your pick. Different camps, all that kind of stuff. But I want to emphasize this. I'm not here to repeat the same thing you've heard before. Because if, you're, if I repeat to you the same thing you've heard before, then you are not going to get any better at healing the sick. Right? So for you to get better, I have to be able to bring something to you that you've not heard before. Right? Now, and the reason you're here, just to be real honest, the reason you're here is because what you've done before and what you've learned doesn't work. Right? Because if what you had learned worked, you wouldn't be here. Right? I don't go to healing conferences. Right? I used to until I found what worked. Now I don't have to go listen anymore. Why? Because it works. I don't, I don't have to chase that and try to find that. I'm not doing that. This works and this is, you know, this is what I was looking for all my life. I, this works like it should. And so I, I say that not to be mean or anything, but just to let you know, <clears throat> almost every argument that you can think of, I thought of when I was studying and chased it out. I mean, because I was taught, again, I had a habit of going to the best. Before I heard of Dr. Lake, I had, if you would talk to my family, even now, our office is about 80% books, right? Our media, uh, the area for the media where, where we do the media part, the duplication or thing, that's just a small part of our office. The vast majority is like a library. And it's all the books that I have purchased over the last 30 years, most of which have to do with healing or power or something along those lines. And honestly, most of them aren't worth reading. Okay? A couple of them out there have been good, but most of it's just the same old stuff. Basically, what happens is this. The message that gets the most acceptance is the one that gets the most publicity. All right? Now, what happens is, a preacher gets an idea. I'm not going to say if it's accurate or not, just to say an idea. He goes to the scripture and tries to find some stuff that either back it up, and again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, I'm just saying that's what the process. Then they write a book. The book gets published. Another preacher hears it or reads it. Then that preacher preaches it or writes a book. And pretty soon, you've got ten books written by ten different people that are all saying the same thing, that essentially they all got it from the same person. Right? They may have just a slight different take, but essentially they're saying the same thing. Now, because you go and you read it and you go, oh, well, I've read it in this book and this book and this book and that, it must be real. No, you got the same thing from ten books that you could have got from the first guy that all the other nine guys got it from. Right? So just because it has the most out there doesn't mean it's right. You watch people on television, doesn't mean they're right because they're on TV. It just means they got money. Alright? 
or it means they're on there begging for it. One of the two, right? Usually more begging for it than having it, okay? Well, not always true. <laughs> Some of them have it and are still begging for it. So, oh, to bless you. They beg for it to bless you. So, <clears throat> not even going to get off on that at this point. We're going to, we'll hold off on that. You say, what? So far we didn't really talk that much about healing. Well, when does the healing part come in? That, this is all about healing. Because what allowed Dr. Lake to see 100,000 healings in five years, 200,000, that's almost a quarter of a million in 10 years. What allowed that was not doctrine. Okay? How many of you are familiar with William Branham? You know who William Branham was? Okay. His doctrine was about as far off as you could get. Okay? He was messed up doctrinally. Right? So if you ever get anything of his, if you, get a, if you see him on video, just fast forward through the preaching to the part where he actually operates in his gift. Because his gift was 100% accurate. All right? Never missed one day. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, he operated in the gift of the word of knowledge. And he would call people up and say, excuse me, you're right back there. He would call her name. She'd come up front. He'd stand there or they would bring him up and stand there, And he'd say, all right, um, now let's see. Your name is Linda and you are from, your, your address is 1523 Indiana Street in Indianapolis. Matter of fact, you drove here this morning in a black 49 Ford. You were in the back seat. You, where's your hat? You had a hat on in the back seat of the car. You don't have the hat on now. But, and, and you were coming up and you ha had a letter from your sister that told you that I was going to be near you, but you didn't want to wait, so you drove over here. And your husband, matter of fact, uh, your, wh why is your husband sitting over there? You were over here. What? And he said, now, is all this, and by this time, the woman just, you know, she's just crying, you know, because it's 100% accurate. But then whenever he would start teaching, Gordon Lindsay, who started Christ for the Nations, <clears throat> told him, stick with your gift. When you operate your gift, because as he was talking to them, he would say, is all this true? Yes, it's true. Well, now, and the reason you're here is because you have liver trouble, and God's healed you right now, so go your way, you're healed. And she, now, what, this is what happens. Because he would tell her all these details, and she knew it was God speaking through him, then her faith in God would rise, and when he said, you're healed by faith, she would grab it. Technically, he wasn't doing anything to heal her other than revealing the word of knowledge, and by faith, she got her own healing. Okay, So you can use any of the nine gifts to help people get healed. You don't have to have the gifts of healings to do it. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, gift of faith, all these things you can use in that direction. Now, they all have specific purposes, but you can operate them in those areas. Now, Gordon Lindsay told him, stick with your gift. Use it, just, just operate in the gift. You bless people, you help people. Don't teach. He said, stay away from teaching. When you teach, you, you mess things up. He would have Napoleon fighting Hitler. You know, I'm talking military history and going into detail. I mean, he had, some, he had some weird teachings and some very harsh teaching. He told women, when an ambulance would come by with the ambulance, the siren going, he would say, women, you hear that? That's your fault. Every sick person, every person dying is your fault because you came from Eve. Now, that's not uplifting. Okay? <laughs> You know, I'd like to do research and find out how many people committed suicide after a William Branham service. You know, I, just, I don't know how many it would be. But, but it's because his teaching was wrong, but his gift was good because he operated in faith. Right? He, but, and they asked him, how do you do that? And he said, well, I just lift myself up over a wall and look into the people's backyard and see what they did. He said, by my faith, I lift myself up and look over. It was by faith that he operated in the gift. Right? And we'll, we'll talk more about gifts as we go along. But I've got to send you to lunch. Already. Man. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and take a break. We will break till 2 o'clock. At, actually, at 2, let's try to be in here and seated. Because as I said, we got a lot of material to cover and we need every minute. All right? So, take a break. We'll see you at 2 o'clock. Y'all get anything out of this so far? All right. All right. Well, God bless you. And we will see you at 2.